Hi, thanks. Are we, are we on? Are we nice and clear? How's the sound? Are we good? We're good. Yep. Okay. Um, thanks for the intro, Cheryl. Um, thanks very much, Jan, uh, for inviting me here. And uh, thanks very much to MUFON for putting on such a, an auspicious event. It would be nice to actually be there and uh, hear everyone else. Uh, Jan did kindly give me a login for MUFON TV, uh, but somewhat ironically, um, the username and password, I couldn't get in <laughs> using that. So um, I wasn't able to hear anyone who's spoken yet today, but I will, I'll listen to it later or tomorrow. Um, in March of 2002, I was arrested for hacking into Army, Navy, and Air Force computers, uh, as well as the Pentagon and NASA. Um, the arresting officers from the National High Tech Crime Unit, which is now part of um, SOCA, the Serious Organized Crime Agency, um, told me that I'd probably do six months community service. Um, this turned out to be a, a highly inaccurate prediction. Um, my arresting officers went to Washington and met with some top brass to discuss my case and uh, also to illegally hand over my hard drive to US authorities, which they're still in possession of. Um, the police officers were obviously very impressed by the military officers they'd met because um, when they returned from Washington and interviewed me for the second time, um, they had a very serious tone about them as it was a very different ball game by them. Uh, the second interview was in the summer of 2002, in August, I think. And in November of the same year, the US authorities announced that they intended to extradite me to stand trial in America. And that on paper, at least, I was facing 70 years in jail, which was a, a far cry from six months community service. So that was very shocking. Um, at the time, they announced their intention to extradite. Uh, the extradition treaty between the UK and the US required that evidence be produced that strongly supported the allegations uh, before a UK citizen could be taken to the US. Uh, US citizens were protected by the Constitution and strong evidence was also required to extradite them. Um, unfortunately for me, my case, uh, amongst others, um, it was at a time when uh, hacking was a big problem. and. Um, my case and others had catalyzed the US and the UK into arranging an entirely new extradition treaty, one where supporting evidence was no longer required to extradite a UK citizen to the US, uh, but you guys were still protected by the Constitution. And this necessary imbalance, as one of the architects of the treaty once called it, still exists to this day. Um, going from six months community service to the thought of the rest of my life in a foreign prison was obviously a major leap and a terrifying one. Uh, the US authorities called my actions the biggest military computer hack ever, which is patently untrue since there have been a few viruses that got into many more computers than I did. Um, I got into less than 100, I think it was about 97. Um, but the real bottom line here was the damage accusations. I was accused of damaging every PC that I was on and told that the amount of damage I'd done to each PC was exactly $5,000 worth. And that happened to be the magic figure necessary to, to, support, to support an extradition request. So I realized I was being fitted up for the damage. Um, I knew I hadn't done any damage, but you can't prove a negative. Uh, under the new treaty, there was no burden of proof for the US. They just had to state your crime and your name. So it was looking very bleak, very bad for me. Uh, two years went by without me hearing much more. Um, this was due to the treaty having to be ratified by the Senate. Uh, for some reason, they were dragging their heels, which was odd since when I'd read the draft of the treaty, it was actually written in US English with American spelling, which was kind of telling. Um, I lost my career in IT due to this, um, so I, I went and got my forklift license and got a job in a local luggage warehouse. Uh, I then lost this job due to all the publicity. Uh, lost the room I'd rented because the landlord didn't like all the press hanging around. Lost my girlfriend of 12 years, so I was feeling pretty crappy to understate it hugely. And spent those two years very down, unemployed. Uh, in 2005, I got another job. Um, strangely working for EDS, Electronic Data Systems, a large American company. Uh, I finished my first day and then made my way home. And uh, as I was walking down the road to my front door, uh, three gigantic men approached me, big burly men, uh, identified themselves as the, the New Scotland Yard Extradition Squad, and escorted me up to my room that I was renting in a shared house. Uh, they insisted on taking my computer, even though they could see I had no internet in the house. Uh, they informed me that I was a fugitive from US law, 
which I thought was kind of strange. How can you be a fugitive when you're not trying to escape? You know? uh, once again, like, the logic of international law enforcement had escaped me, but there was no actual escape for me because the officers drove me to the police station. Um, I submitted to a DNA sample. You're told if you refuse that, they just keep you in a cell until they get permission from the, the high inspector. Um, I was to appear in court the next day for my bail conditions to be set, and this was to be in court for an extradition hearing, not the actual criminal trial. Um, I wasn't given the opportunity to wash or change my clothes, so I walked into court looking like a complete scruff bag, and I could see the, the distaste on the face of the judge, or, or perhaps he always looked like that, I don't know. Um, the US asked for a £10,000 bail, and for me to have to sign on at my local police station every single hour. Uh, which was impossible. My local police station was half an hour from where I lived, so I'd either have to get no sleep or sleep at the police station. Uh, luckily, the judge saw that this was a nonsense request, um, so I was required to sign on at the police station each evening, eventually. Uh, we also got the bail dropped to £5,000 since um, I'd lost my job, my parents lost the children for a living, didn't have any savings at the time. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, my bail was paid by friends and family, all contributing what good. Um, I'll go over the rest of the events in less depth, since it's just a, a chronology of court hearings and decisions. It's kind of like the boring bit, the very depressing, but boring to, to retell. Um, in 2006, I had my first extradition hearing, and the judge ruled that my extradition could be allowed, but the final decision was to be made by the Home Secretary, uh, who also decided it was fine to send me over there without any evidence of damage. The US authorities started to play dirty, um, saying that if I didn't come over of my own free will, then they'd give me the maximum 70 years sentence once I was over there. Uh, my solicitor was told by Ed Gibson, who was the attaché at the US Embassy at the time, that they wanted to see me fry, uh, which was, of course, a reference to the electric chair. Um, they also threatened me with imprisonment in America under military order number one, uh, which means a secret trial with the jury of military personnel. Uh, no opportunity to speak to the press. And they also informed me I'd be allowed no visits from anyone. So they're putting the pressure on, which the DOJ, as you may or may not know, it, it always does. Um, in 2007, we went to the High Court to try and overturn the decision of the Home Secretary to allow the extradition, uh, but the High Court refused to do so. And then in 2008, we went to the House of Lords, but they also refused to overturn the decision. Um, so the next avenue was to go to the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, and we, we lost the appeal uh, to go there, uh, let alone actually be heard there. Uh, later that year, I was doing an interview on ITV, and um, after the interview, quite a few people contacted ITV uh, to say that they thought I was on the autistic spectrum, that I should get diagnosed by a professional to see if this was the case. Um, I didn't like being told I may be on the spectrum, uh, and I was far too depressed to welcome people analysing me and you know, poking around in my brain. Um, but I went along with it since everyone was advising me to do so. And ultimately, I was diagnosed by five or six of the top people in the UK. And they all agreed that I had Asperger's and was on the, on the spectrum. Um, and as I said, no one likes being diagnosed as having a syndrome of any kind, but it did explain a lot. Um, people had always thought I was a little bit weird and kind of robotic <laughs> uh, ever since school. So um, now at least I had some kind of explanation for that, you know, something to blame it on. Um, and it turned out that having Asperger's helped with the case as well, because it's, it's, it's a medical condition. Um, since my actions were due to my hyperinflated sense of truth and justice, which is apparently quite common in people with Asperger's, um, a normal person would have broken the law in the way that I did to find information on UFOs. It was a very extreme act. I, I can see that now. Um, in late 2008, we appealed to the new Home Secretary, uh, but she also had no sympathy for my situation and said she would allow the extradition. And then in 2009, we had a judicial review and we found out Crown Prosecution Service, which is like the English Department of Justice, uh, that the US authorities had no evidence whatsoever that I'd done any damage. It was pure hearsay, uh, yet the CPS still refused to prosecute me in my own country, which is what I was asking. I wasn't asking to be let off and go scot-free. I wanted a UK trial, basically, excuse me. We then asked um, to appeal to the Supreme Court, something we didn't have when I was first arrested. Uh, we were refused leave to appeal to the Supreme Court. And then in uh, late 2009, uh, the Home Office agreed to put the extradition on hold while they looked at our medical evidence. Um, but they said they'd received assurances from the US authorities that all of my medical needs would be met in a US prison. 
Uh, that statement was patently untrue since US jails have a very bad record when it comes to looking after mentally ill inmates. There's lots of reports that have you. In December of 2009, we submitted uh, a new High Court appeal to challenge the extradition, and in January, we were allowed the new judicial review. Uh, in the spring of 2010, the new Home Secretary, Therese May, uh, she agreed to put the extradition on hold again while the new medical evidence was looked at. And in the summer of the same year, Prime Minister David Cameron and President Obama mentioned my case on television, um, hoping that they could work together to find a suitable solution. And in September of 2010, we finally managed to get a review of the extradition treaty itself. Uh, Baroness Patricia Scotland, one of the people that helped push the treaty through, um, said herself that the treaty was necessarily imbalanced due to US citizens being protected by the Constitution. And David Blunkett, who had signed the treaty in the UK, admitted that we might have given too much away. Um, in the spring of 2011, uh, on a visit to the UK, President Obama said he'd respect any decision made by the UK judicial system, which was good to hear. Um, that year, we had growing support from the Conservative Party, which is uh, like your um, Republicans over here. And apart from a few noble individuals, the Labour Party, which is like your Democrats, were absolutely useless and no qualms sending me to the pod. Um, by this time, I'd been severely depressed for years. I was on Prozac. I was really, really leaving the house. I'd also bought enough potassium chloride to kill myself with. And rather than facing 70 years in a foreign jail, potassium chloride is the third chemical used in the triple set of chemicals for lethal injection. Um, as far as I was concerned, these people wanted to see me fry or see me rot, so I wasn't going to let them control the terms or the method of my demise. In 2012, I refused to see the government appointed doctors. I'd already been assessed by the top independent people in the land and saw no reason to submit to further tests. Uh, especially since the pair of doctors the government wanted to use had a track record of getting the results the government wanted, you know what I mean. And finally, on October the 15th in 2012, uh, Theresa May announced her decision to block the extradition. Uh, my family, my girlfriend and I, we cried like babies for it seemed like hours. Um, just, you know, pure relief, ten and a half years worth of tears just running down our faces. Um, there was still the possibility of a UK trial. Uh, which is what I've been campaigning for all this time. Uh, but in December, on my mum's birthday, uh, the CPS, the Crown Prosecution Service, announced that there would be no UK trial and the ordeal was finally up. Um, so that's, that's the decade-long legal battle, uh, the chronology of events. Um, but I think it's also important to give you a, a very brief history of me and why I decided to hack into these systems. Uh, I was born in Glasgow in 1966. I had no siblings. Uh, my parents broke up when I was six. I uh, spent another year living in Glasgow, living with my dad, before going down to London uh, to live permanently with my mum and stepdad. Uh, my parents always encouraged the use of imagination and creativity, um, so I was quite a self-sufficient child in terms of play and recreation. Up top, I was always asking questions about the stars, the moon, and the other planets. Uh, and this fascination just grew as I got up there. Uh, maintain, always maintaining a, a sort of lay person's interest in astronomy and physics and all things space related. I did have one UFO sighting myself, just the one. Uh, it's the only time I've ever seen something with my own eyes in the sky that I, I just couldn't explain. Uh, I was in my bedroom, it was at the top of the house at the time. Uh, it was about 11 or 12, I think, uh, just looking up at the sky at dusk. Uh, I saw this glowing red light just zooming from my very high extreme left going at a massive arc right across the sky to the horizon on my right. Uh, but this wasn't, it wasn't traveling in a straight line. It was really jiggling. It was like brownie in motion, doing lots of seemingly random wiggles as it followed this course. It was a very strange thing. Um, I mean, yeah, if you were being flying in that thing, I, I would have felt you'd just be thrown around like a rag doll, but who knows. Uh, when I was about 12, I joined Bufora, the British UFO Research Association, which is still going strong today. Um, the extension of an interest in the stars to an interest in the life that may live in the planets around that star is a natural. Uh, the thought that some may be visiting us was extremely interesting, extremely interesting. Uh, of course, as a boy turns into a young man, he develops other interests. And my passion for science and strange phenomena was put in the back burner for some time as I started to explore other aspects of life. Um, I left school and spent years doing different jobs, from labouring to hairdressing to office jobs, factory work, warehouse work. 
I spent about a year in each job uh, looking for something that could hold my interest. Um, as my dad always said, uh, most jobs aren't interesting, son. That's why they pay you to do them. It's obviously. Uh, I didn't leave school with many qualifications, <clears throat> but I did have a passion for computers. Uh, I was a self-taught programmer, first in basic and then in assembly language or machine code. Um, and if you're that sort of person, then you'll know that you end up being the one that all your friends call for help. Their computers go wrong. It still happens to this day, very not. Um, and then one day someone suggested I should try and get a job in computing, which weird, I'd, I'd never thought of myself. Um, not having any formal qualifications or experience, the only jobs I could get initially were installation and upgrade contracts, uh, where our business was moving from like Windows 3.11 to Windows for work groups. Yes, it was a long time ago. Um, and as time went on and my experience grew, I was eventually contracting, doing network installations, maintenance, troubleshooting, and eventually systems administration. Um, then one day, at one of my jobs in 93 or 94, uh, I got my first look at the internet. Wow. Um, using the Mosaic browser. Uh, I was amazed that we could view text and images on the computers on the other side of the world. It was fantastic. Uh, I knew it would be a big thing in time to come, and I, I definitely wanted it in my house too, not just at work. Uh, even though Microsoft famously said it didn't think there was anything to it, but um, I don't know if that's a rumor that's true, but apparently they said that. Uh, I got my first dial-up connection in 95, I think. Uh, by then, we had a variety of search engines, no Google yet, uh, and millions of websites, so it had already become a, a useful resource. And uh, the number of UFO enthusiast sites was astounding, so many of them, I could hardly believe it. Um, I had a lot of catching up to do, so whenever I could, I'd browse the net, reading up on UFO history and how the phenomena had grown over the years. Um, around this time, fuel prices were very high in my country. Uh, we had cases of elderly people in the UK having to choose between warmth and food. We called it heat or eat, heating or eating. Uh, and many of them died due to hypothermia because they couldn't afford to pay their fuel bills. Uh, and it's a growing problem to this day. In, in 2015, 15,000 people in Britain died due to so-called fuel poverty. 15,000 people. Um, and one subject I'd read a lot about in connection with UFOs was the free energy. You know, a power source that was virtually unlimited, um, output more energy than was required to operate it. Uh, they call them over-unity devices. Uh, and it's not a mystery, by the way. Um, everyone has an over-unity device in their home. It's your fridge. Um, the average refrigerator is about three times over-unity. Uh, because the heat it puts out, um, you can't make the heat it puts out with the electricity that goes in. Uh, a very well-made fridge, like a science laboratory fridge, can be up to five or six times over unity. Interesting fact. So although you can't create or destroy energy, you can transform it and kind of amplify it somehow. I don't know. I'm not a physicist. Um, so in my mind, these lines of thoughts converge. Old people dying no energy, then possibly free energy that's been hidden from us, hugely unfair. Um, so many of today's problems could be solved if we had free energy. And uh, the UFOs that I've read so much about and watched so many videos of, uh, they seem to operate on a propulsive principle um, that was extremely advanced and probably tapping the zero point energy that I'd read about, uh, literally pumping electrons you know, from the fluctuations of the fabric of the universe, this crazy stuff. Uh, so why didn't we have this technology? You know, many countries around the world had a serious interest in UFOs, um, even detailing in their Air Force's instruction manuals how to engage one and how to report it. Uh, we had the famous Roswell case, where bodies and a craft were supposedly recovered. So why didn't we have amazing flying vehicles and, you know, free energy for everyone? Why, why would you keep that from people? Um, elitism. Obviously, it's, um, it's not your standard radar installation that monitors the skies for UFO tracking. And it's not your regular army that goes out and recovers crashed UFOs. Um, as everyone here knows, these projects are special access and secret compartmented. Um, so very few people see the big picture. And if there are any so-called disruptive technologies, um, they end up in the hands of a relatively small group of people, probably in the 10,000 or less, I would guess, rather than the public at large. And secrets are never good in any relationship, but um, secrets kept from the people and the state by forces unknown of the worst kind of secrets. So I started to wonder, you know, would it be possible to seek out the truth of the matter via the internet and by using my networking knowledge to track down these unknown forces and get a look at their data? Uh, to many people, this you know just seems like a mad idea, but to me it was a noble cause and, and worth looking into. But um, it's a big problem. 
you know, how do you track down a, a secret group of elitists coveting uh, recovered alien technology uh, that probably have their own quantum computing network and time travel machines by now, who knows? Uh, would they even have data on the internet? Um, well, you don't know until you try, but where do you start? Then uh, sometime in the spring of 2001, I think it was, I was told about Dr. Stephen Greer's upcoming Disclosure Project conference at the National Press Club in DC. And here was a man who'd spent years uh, gathering together the most incredible UFO witness list, interviewing them, bonding with them, respecting their anonymity when required. And uh, as I listened to him speak with like, true passion and eloquence about the subject, he became an instant hero to me, instant hero. Right up there with the likes of Linda Moulton Howe, Bud Hopkins, Stanton Friedman, and many, many others in the UFO field. Um, it was an amazing body of evidence, and all from the mouths of mature retirees in the main, who held positions ranging from radar hardware engineers to U.S. Air Force lieutenant colonels and above, you know, generals. And these people were from all of the armed forces right across the board, uh, as well as witnesses from the intelligence community. It really was a fantastic collection of people telling their stories. Um, I bought the Disclosure Project book. Um, wanting to know more of these people's stories and more importantly to use the book for intelligence gathering on possible locations that were internet connected and had something to do with the UFO cover-up. And um, having read the book, as far as I was concerned, Dr. Greer's star witness in this concern was Donna Hare. Um, here was a woman who'd been inside one of NASA's sanitizing labs. Uh, where they regularly remove UFOs from satellite and spacecraft imagery. Um, she was uh, uh, an image specialist. I think she was doing launch lines at the time. And she said that the lab she saw was in Building 8 of Johnson Space Center. Uh, and I was absolutely gobsmacked. It was amazing. I had a physical location that was fairly specific uh, down to the building that the lab was in. Uh, she said she'd been in the lab and been shown one of the photographs by one of her colleagues, um, which she shouldn't have really done because that, that should be secret confirmated as well. But thank God he did because now we know. Um, but how do you get into a network like that? And it turned out to be all too easy, far too easy. I wish it hadn't been easy, though I wouldn't be here today. Um, computer communication languages are called network protocols. Um, the HTTP you use in your web browser is a protocol standing for hypertext transfer protocol. Um, your email service runs an IMAP, which is internet message access protocol. So there's protocols for specific jobs, uh, as well as general protocols that provide for computer to computer communication. Uh, one of these general protocols is called NetBIOS, which stands for Network Basic Input Output System. Um, as its name suggests, it's a system that provides basic input output across the network. Um, for instance, if your office is on a Windows network, when you copy and paste a file from your machine to a colleague's shared drive, it's NetBIOS doing all the legwork and allowing both computers to talk to each other. Um, so that's what NetBIOS is for. It's for local area networks like offices or homes. It's not very secure. Um, unfortunately, at that time, an out-of-the-box Windows installation uh, defaulted to using NetBIOS not just across your home or office network, but also across the internet, basically exposing your network to the world. And uh, one method NetBIOS uses for access to any network resource is the standard username and password combination. And the administrator username, the administrator account, is the most powerful account on the PC, apart from the system itself. And it has access to almost anything. Um, so it was obvious to me that I had, I had to scan the JSC um, Johnson Space Center network, uh, looking for PCs that accepted NetBIOS connections, and then see if they had either weak passwords or unset passwords on the administrator accounts. And it was quite a quick scan. It didn't take long. Um, a surprising number of PCs responded to NetBIOS probes and also returned administra administrator accounts that had no password set, not just a weak password-like password itself, literally no password blank. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so it, it was very easy to set up a tunnel between me and the remote PC that I could use to install remote control software, a bit like PC Anywhere. So it's literally like you're there on the screen, like you're sitting at the monitor of the other computer. You could use a mouse, interact with a desktop, etc. cetera. Um, before installing the remote control software, I first had to find out which PCs uh, were in Building 8. Uh, this was accomplished by using NetBIOS commands again to list the PCs on the remote network. Uh, luckily for me, NASA's IT people were very diligent in their hardware auditing. Every PC had location information as well as serial numbers and the like for auditing purposes. Um, so it didn't take long to compile a list of Building 8 machines that also had administrator accounts that had no passwords. So. Um, 
I installed the remote control software on the first PC in the list, uh, logged on, and looked at the desktop, which is fairly minimal, if I recall correctly, uh, but it had two interesting folders, just like Donna had said. Uh, one was called raw, and the other was called processed, or similar words, I can't remember exactly. Um, I double-clicked on the raw folder, and there was a huge list of files, uh, many of them being over 200 megabytes in size, which was quite large back in dial-up days, because it took about five or six minutes just for one megabyte back then. Um, I considered transferring a few of the files in one go, but thought I'd best inspect one of them first. Um, I can't remember the file extension, but it was a proprietary NASA format, uh, not one of the com common image formats. So I just double-clicked one of the files, and the associated imaging software launched, and I waited. Uh, and then I waited, and then sort of line by line, very slow, very jerky, the image started appearing on the screen, but it was painfully slow. Um, so I shut down the imaging software, I turned the color down to four bits, possibly two bits, um, so you get a lot less color. I uh, turned the resolution down to, I think, 640 by 480 in order to get a look at this image as quickly as possible, you know, in low color, low resolution, and then download it, and then close the connection. So I thought I had plenty of time. You know, I thought I was going to watch this, then transfer it across. Um, I launched the image again, and it was still painfully slow, uh, but it was a few times faster than it was the first time around. And the top second section of the image just seemed to be like a muddy sort of black and gray. Uh, but then the hemisphere of a planet started to appear. And uh, I began to see like cloud formations. Um, I don't remember seeing any recognizable terrain or any terrain at all. Um, I just assumed it was Earth because it was you know, white clouds and the muddy darkness was obviously the space above Earth. And then the craft began to appear. Um, the first, first thing I saw was the top of the dome, because although it was classic cigar-shaped, um, it had these sort of geodesic golf ball, you know, like radar domes above and below. And um, no features of the craft at all, no insignia, uh, no rivets, no seams, no sign of your standard man-made manufacturing at all, very smooth, one-piece object. Um, then I jumped to my seat because the mouse started to move, you know, on its own. Uh, it obviously wasn't moving on its own. Someone who was physically at the machine had seen what I was doing, and they moved the mouse pointer over to the network icon in the system tray, right-clicked it, and chose disconnect. Uh, I couldn't believe it, you know, as I was watching. I hadn't even seen the whole image yet, and I'd been disconnected. Um, so that, that was my eureka moment, but I also lost connection at the same time. But I had seen it. Um, I found exactly what Donna Hare had said would be there. Uh, exactly where she said it would be, a sanitizing lab in Building 8 of Johnson Space Center that processed the imagery. And the first image I looked at featured some kind of exotic craft. So this, it was confirmation in my eyes. It was confirmation of Don Hare's amazing story. Um, I also found another piece of evidence. I think it was on a, a Navy network. I can't quite remember. Um, it supports the secret space fleet theory. Um, it was an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, entitled Non-Terrestrial Officers. I don't know if that was the file name or just the title once you were in the, the spreadsheet. It had uh, names, ranks, um, ship names, a uh, list of materiel, spelt me at the end, you know, materiel, uh, meaning military materials. Uh, chemicals, like exotic sounding chemicals that were under ship-to-ship -ship, uh, ship -ship transfers and fleet-to-fleet -fleet transfers. Um, so, it's, yeah, quite an exotic document. Uh, it was almost like you found the admin office of the secret space program, you know, non-terrestrial officers. That, I googled the phrase at the time, it was nowhere to be found, and now if you google it, it's just in connection with my story. Um, and uh, that's, that's still on my hard drive in Washington, in the office of the, the ONI, the Office of, office of Naval Intelligence. Uh, I don't think I'll see that drive again. And uh, just to set one thing straight, um, I don't remember any of the ship names. You know, I've seen a few people on YouTube and the web and said, oh, he saw you know, the USS such and such, and, but um, that's, that's not true. Uh, I don't remember any of the names. And that's my story. Thank you for listening. We have about uh, a little less than 15 minutes left, Gary, and we have some people, I think, who want to come up and ask questions for you. And if you would, those of you who have some questions, we have a microphone already set up to the uh, side here. If you could come up and ask your question very clearly and uh, quickly into the microphone, I'll repeat it to Gary. 
and uh, then we'll go from there and we'll uh, appreciate the time that Gary's giving us to uh, ask questions. So the microphone is right here to the side and uh, question number one. <laughs> no, but I'll repeat it. Yeah, okay, we could hear. Thank you. Gary, my question is, do you think that one of the reasons there was support for not extraditing you to the U.S. was that this was an unacknowledged project and to bring you to a court and do a trial in the United States. They would have had to acknowledge what was top secret. All right, Gary, did you hear the question? No, nope, can't, can't uh, hear the question. Want, no. Break, breaking up. Uh, you may want to come and repeat the question. Um, standing right here. Okay. Yeah. 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 Just coming up, Jennifer. Thank you. Okay. No problem. Do I need the mic? Can you hear me now, Gary? Was that yes? So my question is, do you think one of the reasons that they didn't bring you to the United States and officially extradite you to do trial here is because if they had, they would have had to acknowledge. He can't hear. It keeps breaking up. Can you possibly type the question? <laughs> Sorry, it's just breaking up a lot. Speak slowly. If the U.S. brought you... I can't hear you at all. C can you type the question in Skype? What did he say? Okay. It probably won't work. Use the what? We, 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 you want to try I? and type that yeah, out? Yeah, I can try to type it real quick. Okay. Hi. Where would I type? I guess you type right there. Right there? Okay. Yes, bear with us. This is a pretty incredible experience. Where's the repeat button? Where's the repeat button? Uh, Where's the delete button? Okay. If the U.S. brought you were to stand trial in the U.S. Can you hear me, Gary? No. Still not hearing. Bear with us. Everyone behind the black curtain is working diligently to bring this to you in living color, all the way from London. It's, it's roughly, probably, it's going to have a typo in there. Okay. Just, okay. Did, did you send it? Oh, how do I hit send? How do I send? Enter. <laughs> Enter? Right there. Right, right, right there. Okay, so the question is, if you were to stand trial in the U.S., the U.S. would have to admit to a black budget project. Um, okay, good. Prob probably not, because uh, they'd, have, they'd have a secret trial like they threatened me with under military order number one, so you guys wouldn't get to hear anything about it. Oh. Okay, what we're going to try to do, I guess if we have no other way of doing this, is uh, I'll ask a couple of questions, and uh, Jennifer can type them into the computer and send it to London. And my question is... Um, I found it interesting that the new treaty was struck between, you don't have to type all of this, the UK and the US. The terms of the treaty between the US and the, the UK were changed according to what Gary says, and that was in adjusting the damages they assessed him with to the exact amount and also removing the burden of proof uh, uh, for the US if I understand, understood that correctly. So the question is, what was his feeling about the new treaty arranged between the UK and US because of his case? Okay, the terms of the treaty were changed because of the, so the burden of proof and damages proof 
adjusted to exact. removed from the U.S. responsibility for extradition. Well, the burden of proof uh, was removed that the, the, the U.S. did not have to meet a burden of proof in order to extradite him making it easier for the U.S. to extradite him, and also the damages were the exact amount that they had reset under the new treaty. I'm not sure I quite just agree. Do you think that's right? Uh, the terms uh, of the treaty were changed because of you, so the burden of proof, that, uh, that's, not, that's really yeah. not what you're saying. Just say, uh, I, um, what, how does he feel about the new treaty? because of his case between the U.S. and U.K. Okay. All right, we'll see if he, he gets this one. So the burden of proof yeah, there was a time you could even try this. To the US. Um, well, the new, the new treaty, they, it hasn't really changed at this end in the UK. Um, they've put what they call a forum bar on it um, so that it's not the Home Secretary that makes the final decision anymore. It has to be judges. So that, that's the big change in the UK. Um, so you, you guys are still protected by the Constitution, uh, but us poor guys can still be lifted and taken just on a whim. Okay, ask him uh, how he managed to uh, secure as an attorney and uh, pay for the legal fees, and how much were those fees? When you're this close, I can hear you quite clearly. I don't know if you can hear In me. In his defense. How did, you, how did you manage to get an attorney and pay for all of the expenses? How much were your expenses throughout all of your defense? get an attorney. Um, in Britain, we have this amazing thing called legal aid, uh, whereby if you're unemployed, um, you get free legal advice. Um, I was very lucky to have that at the time, because now that's no longer the case. Um, so yeah, I, I didn't have to pay for any of it. So um, my next question would be, what would be your, your advice to any, um, any other person who might be as curious like you to pursue whatever UFO information and extraterrestrial information they feel might be out there. So what would be your advice to anyone else researching extensively beyond the law like you? Did, did it work? Okay. Sorry, I didn't see that pop up there. Uh, what would be my advice to anyone as curious as me in the yeah. future? Uh, as I said to Cheryl the other day, um, always listen to your girlfriend or your wife. Uh, when they say, so don't do that, it's stupid. You can do a lot, a lot of legal research. Oh, yeah, it Okay. Um, thank you for speaking, Gary. I'm an attorney and a retired prosecutor. I'm kind of curious if you can tell us, had this case gone to trial, what would your tactic have been? What would your defense have been to try to be acquitted by a jury in the United States? Thank you. your defense have been, Gary? How would you try to convince a jury to find you not 
guilty. What would your trial tactics have been, or can you comment on that? Because you'd face a jury trial in the United States. What would you tell the jury? Why should they acquit you, find you're not guilty? Had this case gone to trial, what would my defense have been in the U.S.? What would the trial tactics be? Um, well, I mean, I, I fully admitted the guilt of unauthorized access, um, but our only contention was the accused damage. And uh, we did eventually find out they had no evidence of the damage, which I knew, because there was no damage done. Um, but if I'd have gone, if it had been a military order number one trial, then, you know, very few rights. Uh, you're treated like an enemy of the state. So um, I don't know how that would have gone. I don't think it would have gone well for me. Um, yeah, I mean, I've been honest, I've been full of frank the whole way, admitting the unauthorized access and you know, all my interviews and police interviews, so who knows. Next, we're doing our best. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your question. Hello, Gary. My name is Mark, and my, I have a very simple question. Is there any way you could remember the name or names of any ships that you saw? remember the names of the ships you saw. No, I can't remember. It was a long time ago. I couldn't remember um, a few years afterward some of the names. So. Is it possible that they were, because I heard this one time, USSS Curtis LeMay and USSS Helen Keeter. SS Curtis LeMay and USSS Helen Peter. Is it possible one name was USS Curtis LeMay? It doesn't ring a bell. Um, but I, even if you had all of them on a list, I don't know if I'd remember them just by reading them. Okay, next question. Hi, would you consider being regressed so that you could recall any of those names and material transfers? The question was, would you consider being regressed so that you could recall any of those names? Would you consider being regressed to recall any of those names? She's doing a great job. Thank goodness for Jennifer. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, I'd definitely like to be regressed. Um, I'd also like to be regressed because a, a strange... Can I, can I tell a very quick story? It'll take, like, one minute. Yeah. Um, 2006, summer of 2006, um, my girlfriend and I are in my bed sip, uh, which is one room in a shared house. Uh, we went to bed, and um, I was woken up. It must have been like 2 or 3 a.m. I was in a really deep sleep, and I was woken up by a really sharp pain in my foot, in my heel. And um, I, you know, I le leaped forward and got up to, to go and find out what on earth was hurting my foot so badly. And I immediately just went back to sleep like that, like immediately unconscious again. And in the morning, on the back of my heel were two perfectly circular holes about this far apart, about a centimeter apart, both about five or six millimeters across, one with a perfectly circular flap of skin hanging off it, as if like a hole punch. I was on the first floor, there's no way it could have been an animal, apparently. Um, so I'd love to be regressed to find out what happened that night as well. All right, thank you so much, Gary. We are uh, out of time. Thank you for your patience, your understanding. And uh, we did have some members of the audience who wanted to say thank you for uh, speaking with us today and for taking our questions as well as we could get them to you with the technology that we <laughs> are facing. So thank you for your patience and your interest. And a big thank you to...